Romans chapter 16. So, so I, I was thinking about it. I'm like, all right, okay, let's, we mentioned it. And I'm, I'm honestly not trying to get in the middle of all this stuff. But there are only a certain number of texts that are actually directly relevant. And uh, Summer told me that she got a, a message through Sheologians um, saying, you've got to ask your dad to address this stuff in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and this, this stuff uh, about these, these, the, about uh, authority and, and stuff like that. And Summer's like, you mean like on yesterday's dividing line? And oh, that's great. That's fantastic. It's wonderful. So it's like, okay, cool. So somebody found it useful. Um, yeah, <laughs> too busy listening to geologians to listen to the dividing line. Uh, that's what you get. So anyway, you got to listen to both of them. That's, that's, the, that's the important part. So I was like, all right, let's, let's just at least explain to everybody. Because if you hear someone say, yeah, but what about Romans 16? You start reading Romans 16 and going, um, <laughs> what? There's, there's really nothing here about um, men and women in, in authority positions. And this is a bunch of personal greetings and stuff. What What is going on here? Well, all right, let's let's introduce you to the argument and you can make up your mind from there. We're talking about Romans 16, 7. Greet Andronicus and Junius is what the New American Standard has. My kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are outstanding among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. That's it. Now, immediately you might sit back and go, wait a minute. So the egalitarians who are pushing, well, an egalitarian view that there need to be women pastors and women elders and women bishops. And that eventually leads to the liberal Lutherans having transgender bishops and so on and so forth. They're actually using names in greeting lists as primary source texts. So remember, when we looked at 1 Timothy 2, and we were looking at that word to exercise authority that they say, well, that's to domineer. That's not, that's not just regular exercising, it's domineering authority. Lots well, of hopox agamina. It's the only place that's used. And you're not supposed to use a hopox to establish something like that. Well, guess what? Same thing here. So now, now we so we have a hopox over there, and now we've got a singular use of a name over here. And it does make you sit back and go, you know, if they really had much of a case, they wouldn't be having to use stuff like this, but it's all they got. It's all they got. So the the issue is Junius. Junius. Uh, Aspasaste Andronicon Kine Union. Now, here are just some of the things that you need to be aware of. First of all, this is a textual variant. That doesn't ever help anybody. Um, there, it was, it is interesting to me that as I was reading a few articles on this, that theologians in general tend to dismiss textual evidence without wading into it quite as deeply as they, they should. Because you have Union. Oh, and I was gonna I was gonna pull up Sinaiticus. I might still I might still do that. Um I might I might pull that up if I can. Um so that you can see uh what we're looking at here. Um I'm not sure if that's gonna work out real well. Um well, uh, it's yeah, that's that's good enough. That's that's good enough. I'll pull it up here in a second. Uh I'll let you let you bring it up. Uh the 
there are manuscripts beginning with P46. Not, not yet, not yet, not yet. There are manuscripts beginning with P46. And then there's one, two, three, four. And then what's interesting is uh, Boharic, Armenian. There's some manuscripts of the Vulgate. In other words, there are foreign language translations that likewise do not have Unius, they have Julian, which is the Greek version of our, our Julie. So you have a textual variant. The earliest papyri manuscript of Paul that we have has that reading rather than the vast majority of the others and other translations that have union. Now, the problem is that the difference between the masculine and feminine for union is only distinguished by the accenting. And there is no accenting in the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament that is developed much later. And so, for example, I brought up uh, Codex Sinaiticus here. This is not the um, this is not a photocopy of Sinaiticus. I have that in here. I'm not sure why it doesn't pull up, but you can see uh, what Union would look like here. Unia with a line over top of it there, right over on the side here. Um, there would not be yeah right right here. Um, there would be no way of knowing. For the first eight, nine hundred years of the transmission of the text, whether that was specifically meant to be a masculine or feminine form. Just simply by looking at it. There's there's no there's no uh way of differentiating them. And then obviously, eight or nine hundred years later, once it's put into minuscule text where you have large letters and small letters and spaces between words and accenting, now it's editorial. It's it's how the person and whoever's copying it interprets that. Uh, to be, if they even know, honestly, the rules of accenting, which, to be honest with you, most people today don't either, and I certainly didn't enjoy learning them. So, um, we don't know whether this is a masculine or a feminine form. It's a hotbox. It's not used elsewhere in the New Testament. Then when you start diving into the use of what could be behind this name, because there's a whole area of discussion of terms of endearment. When you, like, my name is James. So as a little kid, my mom would use Jimmy. Well, that's, that's not technically the same name, right? It wouldn't be spelled the same way. If someone who didn't know English very well, uh, ran across uh, like comments in my my third grade teacher's comment in my grade report uh, where she, she said, Jimmy tends to rush to try to be done first and sometimes the quality of his work suffers as a result, which I hid from my mom for over 20 years. Um, <laughs> successfully, by the way. Um, they, they might look at that and go, well, th this can't be James White because this is someone named Jimmy. Well, we know, no, that's the same person. And there were rules for uh, what kind of shortening of words. And in some languages, you would shorten the name. Some, some would actually lengthen the name. And Greek and Latin were opposite of one another. And so if you are talking about people who live in Rome, the Latin is obviously there in Rome, as is Greek. And so there's a whole bunch of discussion about, is this Unianus, um, Unia, uh, is, is, what, are the, what are the possibilities? And of course, you have... Uh, those who would say, well, it looks like Andronicus and Unius are a couple. Husband and wife. There are a number of places that have that form. 
uh, in the New Testament as well, Priscilla and Aquila. Um, and so is that a possibility? The fact is we just don't know whether this is a masculine or a feminine. We don't know the relationship between Andronicus and Unius. Could be a married couple. They could be uh, messengers sent out because there's the apostles at that time. You had the apostles and then you had all sorts of other apostles who were basically missionaries sent out. Uh, Paul had those that he sent out to the various churches and brought reports back to him. And so there are those that would say that Andronicus and Unius uh, were people who worked for Paul, two men who were sent out by Paul, who brought Paul information from the churches, and as a result, had become his fellow prisoners. They too had been arrested for their bold proclamation of the truth while they're out there, uh, while they're out there doing that. And that's what it means is who are outstanding among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. So that's possible too. The whole argument, and you can take, uh, yeah, the whole argument from the egalitarian side requires you to take, to become quite dogmatic about a number of issues that you cannot be dogmatic about in any meaningful way fashion at all. So you'll find certain articles saying nobody in the early church ever thought there was anything other than a male. That's not true. But it's repeated so often that people think that it's true. Um, and all of it designed to create this interpretation. Greet Andronicus and Unius, feminine form. My kinsman, and that, by the way, is Sungenais, from which you get Sungenis, kinsmen, uh, could be cousins, but obviously isn't here, and my fellow prisoners. So they have run afoul of the Roman Empire, um, as Christians seem to do regularly. Hmm, this is only three chapters after Romans 13. wonder how that happened. Anyway, another subject, won't get into it right now. And my fellow prisoners who are outstanding among the apostles. Now, there's two ways of understanding that. You could say outstanding amongst the apostles, and the, the phrase entois apostolois, the end there can be they are a part of the number of apostles. And they are considered to be outstanding in that number. Or it can be out there. They are considered to be outstanding by the apostles. So they are well known amongst the apostles. And I'd be using apostles in the specific term that Paul defends his own apostleship as an apostle of Christ, apostle to the Gentiles, etc., etc., and so you'd, you'd, you'd be talking Peter, James, and John apostles, and those apostles consider the and Andronicus and Junius to be outstanding. They have a reputation amongst those apostles. Um, some would argue, no, these, these have to be being numbered as apostles themselves. But it doesn't have to be taken that way. But that's the whole point. So the the, the egalitarians are saying it's definitely feminine. This is apostles as in authoritative, not just simply sent out to gather information um, as missionary type individuals, but authoritative apostles holding position of teaching authority in the church. And that means Unius was a female apostle like Paul was an apostle and therefore, egalitarianism is established. Okay, so did you know? Was that? Did you know? Got all, you knew all that before we started this, right? He says yes. So I just, yeah, he 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 understood all of that. He knew every bit of it. It's the first time what? Oh. Oh. 
I don't remember having done it before, but anyway. Um, so there's the whole thing. And you cannot refute the assertion that it is possible to read Romans 16, 7 with Unius being a female and with Unius being included amongst apostles. The issue is what kind of apostles are being referred to here. We're not talking about the 12, but that raises the whole issue of the expansion of the concept of apostleship, which a lot of these folks want to get into. But the other side, if they're honest, will say, well, but we, this is just one possibility. We don't know that Unius is feminine, could be masculine. You've got a, you've got a hopox there. There are all sorts of possible possibilities. Uh, the root of that name is very popular. And there are all sorts of forms that were made of it and things like that. Um, it's possible that this is a married couple. Um, which would raise all sorts of issues if you now want to define apostles as Paul is an apostle. And therefore having the authority to speak with the authority of one of the twelve. Um, but that's... That's the whole situation. That's the whole the whole issue uh, as as it is presented. And given the number of completely possible other scenarios, it's possible this is a married couple. It's possible these are two men. It is possible that Unius isn't even the right word. Julius is Julian is, and that that would emphasize the male-female couple marriage situation. Um, it's possible that, that, that these were outstanding as in, as seen by the apostles, not being numbered amongst the apostles. All of those things are possible. And you might say, well, I just don't like when scripture isn't real specific. It's a greeting. It's a greeting at the end of a letter. That's the problem. If this stuff was meant to be clear, you wouldn't have to be grabbing stuff like this. This is sort of like when you're dealing with Roman Catholicism and Mary, and they find her everywhere. Um, once you've got that overriding desire to find that kind of stuff, well, you're gonna you're gonna find that kind of stuff. Yeah. The other side of this is however you categorize the two of them whether they're male, female, etc., there's also the issue of the structure of the, the sentence. He personally addresses, refers to them as my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, and then shifts gears, who are outstanding among the apostles. And I look at that and go, you know, no matter how you want to refer to them in that regard, he separates out his language as he goes to their reputation among the apostles. That, that's the way I'm looking at this, because I, I don't see him making a case for either of them being an apostle here. Well, the whole issue is, um, see, uh, epistemoi, what is translated outstanding, um, can carry with it the idea of well-known entois apostolois. And if you if you take that understanding of uh, epistemoi, uh, I'm sorry, epistemoi, um, then it changes everything. And so the, the whole the whole point is here, there are lots of possibilities. And so, what does it say about a movement that has to take one amongst many possibilities that you cannot prove one way or the other because the, the text was never intended to? Paul did not intend this greeting to answer the question. But when he did address it clearly, 
they find ways around that too. They find ways around that too. So there you go. Um, there's, there's the problem. There's the issue.